Hello, welcome to this very special edition of the Electronic Cafe. This is the episode where Mark and I will show you our chat with the fabulous Andy McCluskey from OMD. And we talk about the new album, Bauhaus Staircase, amongst other things. Um, I just want to say, you know, we've had some pinch yourself moments since we've been doing this, and this was certainly one of them. You know, we've been fortunate enough to meet some amazing artists. Uh, but yeah, sit back and enjoy our conversation, say, with the fabulous Andy McCluskey. You played on the famous 101 show in Pasadena with Depeche Mode, mm-hmm. with Thomas Dolby and yourself. Um, what, what was it like? What was it like to play with that show? Yeah, and why? What was it like to play that show? One phrase comes to mind. I was shitting myself. This is one of those monumental moments on the Electronic Cafe. Mark and I are so pleased to welcome a total legend to the show, Mr. Andy McCluskey. Welcome to the EC. We're so delighted to have you here, my friend. Um, Gentlemen, I'm delighted to be with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andy. Um, and honestly, look, um, huge congrats on album number 14, which is out next month. Uh, you know, going back, you know, 40 odd years, like when you and Paul started this journey, did you ever think you'd still be making such amazing music 40 years on? Amazing music or not, I certainly don't think I'd still be doing this. So, um, yeah, it's it's been a remarkable journey. I mean, you know, as as you probably well know, the, the band was created for one concert. So it's been a very, very extended tour from one concert. But, um, yeah, you know, we're really enjoying ourselves. You know, it, 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 in, in many ways, it's been a lot nicer being in Orchestral Manus in the Dark the second time around. Sure. There's less pressure. We don't have the deadlines. We will only release something when we think it's ready to be heard. Um, so, yeah, we're really enjoying it. But I, did I think it would be 45 years later? Hell no. <laughs> well, we're glad you have, mate. We really are. And, and the, the new album, I mean, I know you're a massive art fan. The Bauhaus Stairways um name of the album is that taken from i, I think is it oscar or oscar schlemer or something is that where you got the inspiration for the name of the album from yeah he he taught at the bauhaus um and he he paid, he did a painting called bauhaus staircase so the title comes from his painting oh. um but the broader context of of the song is really that it's um I'm using Bauhaus as a metaphor for all that's positive and strong about art and how it can feed the soul and challenge the status quo and inspire as well as entertain. And I think yeah. that um, I think that the the guys who did the video really got on that and, and took my idea to another level and kind of but turned it into a sort of 1984 stroke Fahrenheit 451, but without Big Brother and the and the book burners, but with the art police chasing them down. They did a great video. Do you know, it's funny that you almost asked my next question, because I, I say we love the video, and obviously I was going to ask if you had any input, and clearly you did. So... Um... I didn't need to have a lot of info to be on to be honest because the the guys who made the video understood where I was coming from. I mean, it's quite interesting that that we we put out on a Friday evening that we were looking for videos to this sort of clearing house of video uh, producers. Uh, we had 56 replies by Monday, but all these guys did was they just started work because they knew where I was coming from. And the first thing I saw on Monday was the first 40 seconds of the video. They just went, here, does this work? And I went, right, forget the rest. I'm sorry, this is what it's going to be like. Because, ah. you know, so often when somebody does a video pitch to you, uh, it reads well, 
but you are you are, you end up, it's like reading a novel you start imagining your own characters and the look and yeah. then when you see the final version you go well that wasn't what i imagined i'm now having to adjust here yeah. i had no i had no adjustment process because quite simply i saw the first 40 seconds and i just went hell yes i'm having that and then i then i talked to um i i talked to to andy Wall- Whitehurst, who's, who's kind of the front man for Cine 1080. And, uh, you know, he's like, he's like, we were so excited. We wanted this. We wanted this. We spent all weekend doing it because we wanted it. Because yeah. he said, you know, when I was 16, I loved the Dazzle Ships album. And I got my 13 year old mate, GB, who works in the company with me, into Dazzle Ships. And we're huge fans and we want this. I'm like, well, you yeah. got it. You got it. So, and actually now I've been so delighted with what they've generated that, um, they're doing the next five, four videos. <laughs> um, uh, the only thing is I've had to beat up our manager and Paul in the band to, um, to to find the funding. I think we're going to use some of the some of the tour money uh, to fund the videos because the video budget is... Uh, I've now tripled the video budget. <laughs> your body was departed, but your lips didn't go. Visually, it's very it's stunning with the colours and the uh, and the artworks. So, I mean, you know, it was a it's a slam dunk, really. I guess for you, you guys, they took the um, they took the colours of the sleeve, the the, the grey and the black and the red, and, yeah. and they ran with it. Um, and it's just the images are strong. The storyline is great. It leaves you hanging at the end. It was their idea to use the the gallery of our sleeves, which was a stroke of genius that blew me away, and and um, and I just. I got so intoxicated that um, we were just buzzing because I always, because I come from a visual background, I was supposed to go to uh, Leeds to do a fine art degree and I took a gap year. And that's when the band started. I never went back. But, um, and I've got a funny story to tell you about that, actually. Remind me right. later. They, I, I got always, always interacted really well with Peter Saville, who did our sleeves, because he could talk to me about art movements and where his reference points were, and I got it. So it was it was the same with, with, with these guys from Cine 1080. So, so Andy, I mean, there's throughout the OMD catalogue, there's been many references to historical references and artistic references. I mean, mm-hmm. Enola Gay and Dazzle Ships and Tesla Girls, it just, it's endless. Um, as a 15 year old, it was fascinating for me to uh, to learn about these things as well as uh, listen to the songs, these great songs. I mean, e- even the likes of like, yeah, Louise Brooks. I mean, who was Louise Brooks? I mean, you, you look up Louise Brooks, fascinating stories. They don't, don't seem to write songs like that anymore. Every day is a school day when you're listening to a customer who's in the dark, isn't it? <laughs> well, it I mean, it is. But an I entertaining mean, one, I hope. Oh, I God. mean, you know, even as a 15 year old, say Enola Gay, is a great, great song. It's one of those songs which was like an, an epiphany moment for me. But then I, I a 15-year-old, I didn't know what an Ola Gay was. And then it's a learning process. Like your whole catalogue is, is littered with um, a learning experience. The bottom line is is quite simply that, that, that I wanted to write lyrics that were about things that interested me and definitely not what I saw as cliched lyrics. You know, if I'm interested in aeroplanes and oil refineries and historical characters and I fell in love with pictures of Louise Brooks, I didn't know who she was. I was just in Covent Garden Market and there was a store that was selling like, you know, uh, like publicity stills of Hollywood movie stars. And I just saw her and I went, wow. Who is she? And I started collecting photographs of her. Hmm. Then I read about her. She became fascinating because she had a kind of strange career, but amazing yeah. woman. And um, yeah, if I get fascinated by something, then then I, I I want to write about it. And obviously, then you know, people like you guys who are obviously you know intelligent young men who are seeking interesting things get. <laughs> Get fascinated by the subject. She I says. love the intelligent and the young. I'll take that very gladly for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll take either of those two. But I mean, even say Louise Brooks. There's a similar one on the current album with um, Verushka, mm-hmm. which, which again it was one of the first supermodels, uh, German supermodels. I, I didn't know at the time. And you know, the album 
it's very overtly political. I mean, you've always had undertones of polit- politicalness, is that a word, in, in your albums. But I mean, the album seems, this album seems to be overtly political. I mean, there's songs, Anthropocene and Kleptocracy. Kleptoc- 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 you know, there's songs for which, admittedly. It's a spelling test. As well, I, isn't it? <laughs> or a pronunciation test. Yeah, man, you're just check, check, crossing through the intelligent bit right now. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, admittedly, I mean, I, I looked at those and I thought, oh, here we go, Google, find out what that's all about. But, I mean, again, you're you're still um, pushing the boundaries on subject matter in your songs, which is really, really interesting. Another stranger Kleptocracy was written because um, I was angry. I still believe in democracy, but it feels like it's being stolen from us by charlatans and big money. Um, So, I mean, I usually use things I'm fascinated with and I, and I, and I, I, I hide them in poetic words and metaphor, but I haven't named any names in this song, but you know exactly who I'm talking about. Um, yeah. You know, dirty slogans on the red bus door, the narcissist stole the exit. You know who that's about, yeah. Brexit. Um, yeah. Saudi money over Central Park, Khashoggi's body got dissected. That's a pretty straight up lyric. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah. there's, there's, there's others about Trump and, and various things. I mean, it basically, um, and Putin. I mean, the sad thing is, you know, this song was written three years ago, and Putin, Trump, and Boris are still affecting our lives. You know, it's uh, yeah, yeah. and and and, and yeah. Trump may come back, and Putin is worse than he ever was. So, yeah. I was angry, and I wanted to write that song. Um, Anthropocene is something that I've always been fascinated by history. I mean, before I got into art, I actually wanted to be a um a paleoanthropologist in fact i met one of my heroes last year when i did a concert with uh, brian cox um professor alice roberts was there doing a five minute presentation it was an amazing mishmash of music and science and of course i've adored alice since she was on time team about nearly 30 years ago and so to meet her and she was just as lovely and fascinating in person um so i've always had this interest in the history of the human species and so um anthropocene is 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 the, the phrase now that's used for the current geological epoch that the homo sapiens are now got enough hubris uh, the ego to say that we we're creating our own ge- geological era and we probably are but yeah. and there's an there's another there's another song on the album called evolution of species and anthropocene and evolution probably go together because if evolution teaches you anything It's that species do not remain the same. And Homo sapiens have only been around for maximum 300,000 years. But if we, in the future, we will either mutate into something that isn't a Homo sapiens or we won't be here anymore. And evolution teaches you one or the other. And so the end of Anthropocene is, you know, the, 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 the lyrics are, you know, spoiler alert, but, you know, I'll give it to you anyway, you know, um, one million years after now, global human population is zero. Yeah, I, I listened to a, a Brian Cox thing last night and he was talking about, um, you know, the sun will probably engulf the earth in five million years time, but the human race or population will be extinct by then because it'll be too hot or, you know, it, we will have to... That's assuming, die. That we, that's assuming we hang around for that. Yeah, and they were saying, you know, we might, we might be gone or destroyed ourselves by then so yeah well i mean it, it's i mean cox is another fabulous person I, i've been delighted to have actually been able to get to know him in the last couple of years and um I, he, he actually where we mix in paul's studio in the south of france uh, brian was on holiday there a few weeks ago. unfortunately i wasn't there so he and his family popped around to paul's house to listen to the album he, he got a preview but hmm. um 
Yeah, he, he's fascinating. I mean, it was quite good fun, actually, when he asked me to do this thing at the Royal Albert Hall. And uh, I just said, well, I'll do it as long as you play keyboards in Enola again. He was like, can I? Can I? He was such a fanboy. It was great. I was going to say, his best work was <laughs> D-Ream, wasn't it, sir? Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> well, apparently he didn't even play on the the, the hit record. So he, he came in afterwards, I think. But he, he, he he's, a, he's another lovely guy. And, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, obviously, it's frightening what he knows and remembers. I mean, I... I I, I haven't got the brain capacity that he has, but um, yeah, it's, you know, this stuff is, is interesting and, mm. uh, and I want to sing about it. Going back to the Verushka thing, that actually kind of came about by chance initially. But um, I asked Paul because I because I was busy sitting in this room during COVID because there was bugger all else to do. So I was I just went back to writing songs, and I kept begging Paul to send me more stuff. Um, he was rather busy moving house four times and making a baby, but he did finally send me a bit of music. <laughs> and um, one of them was this track, which which just had a working title called Verusha. And in fact, it wasn't a track, it was just a chord sequence. Yeah. And um, it was something that he and Claudia Brooken were going to do for one, two, but obviously they split up and it never happened. So he gave me that. And I, I, I wrote the chorus on it very quickly. I, I built the song out of these chords and I wrote the chorus but I couldn't, for the life of me, think about what to sing in the verse. And, and um, eventually, I just, I Googled, like like you did, I Googled Verushka and came up with the actress and the film noir movie that she was in. I went, film noir, there you go. I can, I've got loads of visual images. So I just started singing about, you know, headlights flash across a rain-soaked road and another stranger falling through the night. It's just, it's just me painting verbal pictures that you imagine in nice. a film noir so yeah, it, yeah, yeah. That, that's how it came together I was, I was really i was reading uh i think it is in blitz actually because i think you have the game you're kind of ahead of us in terms of yeah you know, a lot of the albums created in lockdown and, and is it you've discovered the creative power of total bloody boredom <laughs> is that right yeah i mean i likened it to being a teenager when i lived at home and you know my dad was out at the greyhounds and my mother finally stopped working and took over the tv there was only three channels and if she was watching you know starsky and hutch or kojak i'd go sod this i'd go up to my room and and either paint a painting or or pick up my bass and start trying to write some music and and that was it there was nothing else to do in covid so i ca i just came in this room and started mining my two big g5 computers down here for anything that i could make a song out of that i'd started and begging Paul to send me some bits and pieces. I mean, Paul, even at the best of times, Paul is like bad Santa. Uh, he was worse over COVID, but it's like, you know, he he will usually give you something that is like, like well, I've got this broken toy. Can you make something out of two wheels? And you go, yeah, all right, I'll start with that. Then, you know, it's like, but Anthropocene, I've been wanting to write the lyrics for that for ages. And I, I had two pieces of music that were, weren't really working and anthropocene you know for those who haven't yet heard it there's there's two different types of text to speak there's a there's a male voice and a female voice just talking about the information and i had that but i the my music was like hmm. and then paul sent me this piece of music that that i think was going to be an advert for his wife's perfume company but she rejected it <laughs> I told you, it just sends me the broken toys. Um, <laughs> and as, as soon as I put it up, um, I start, oh, maybe I could get my text to speak on here. And so I, I played it to my son and, and I said, do you think this new version works better than the old one? He went, do you really need me to tell you? <laughs> so, so, And then he had this sort of strange, strange string synth phrase that sort of, hinted at a possible melody but wasn't one so i took that idea and made the melody out and then i had all of this and i just went damn now i have to come up with some words because <laughs> this could be a song 
what the hell am I actually going to sing about Anthropocene? So, so that one came from from really a complete backing track that Paul. Yeah, did. yeah. It, it was it was more of a toy than I normally get, and then also 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 a song called "Look at You Now," which um, frankly sounds like me singing a, a Paul souvenir style song because it is Paul. Paul actually had the melody that was a piano melody, and I said, I said, oh, this sounds like Chariots of Fire. This can be our Chariots of Fire. And then I took his piano melody and just went, ah, fuck it, let's put the synths on, let's go for the big synths. Uh, and it suddenly uh, just this uh, became an o a ringing uh, OMD synth melody, and um, and I started singing along with it. So it's um, yeah, it's it's been it's been a good couple of years in this room, but you know I, I'm yeah. not sure I'll ever do it again unless there's another pandemic, which I hope there isn't. Oh God. You um, you mentioned that you played the song to your son. Am, am I right in saying your son's in a band as well, isn't he? He was in a band called MIG-15 and they supported us a few years ago. Unfortunately, COVID put pay to the band. They just, yeah. they were releasing tracks during COVID. They wouldn't get anywhere. They couldn't do any gigs and it just all fell apart, unfortunately. So that it, it, in common with, oh, I, I thought they were an absolutely great band and I don't think I was delusional just because he's my son. But I think that, um, I think that COVID, you know, for a lot of young adults who hadn't quite established themselves in life, it's just been, yeah. it's been a three year yeah. disaster. It must have been particularly hard for a new band in Kobe because just you know, just when you get started and you want to capitalise on that momentum, it shuts down for two years. I mean, I mean, me and Andy did earlier this year. We did our first electronic cafe live event in the Water Rats in London, and we put on um, who did we have on? We had Beautiful Machines who supported you. Yeah. They yeah. head they headlined it. Oh um, no name. Oh um, no name. A National Milk Bar. Um, like you know, which was. Yeah, part of our thing for starting this channel was me. Me and Andy was in bands for for many years, and we just want to give exposure to these newer bands coming through. You know, we have a Facebook uh, page which runs parallel to the channel, and we're always posting. Have you listened to this? Have you listened to this? Mm -hmm. So we're trying to give exposure to like new bands. But I mean, your your son's band was obviously a victim of COVID. Like, you know, it must have been really difficult for a lot of bands around that time. It really, it really was, and I think it's you know the 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 showcase window that you offer, um, and and you know other kind of you know other online electronic magazines as well as as, as what you do, it's it's really essential. You know, it's so hard to get into the music industry now that any kind of leg up or open door is is you know is is mm. really great, and also it helps people like me because when I'm looking for support bands, yeah, that's where I go looking. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. So because uh, we've just announced, we just announced our second one, which is in March next year, and we've got Wolfgang Fleur, who's uh, head, like, who's headlining it. Mm -hmm. Mark Reader, DJ. Mark Reader, you know yep. the, fa the factory uh, uh, Joy Division right, yeah. uh, publicist, um, and Tiny Magnetic Pets. They're on the bill as well. Great band, um, Peter De Peter De Gaal. So I mean, you know, we it's three times as big as the, the last one we did. So we are kind of like you know. Crossing our fingers. Well, but that's good. That's that's great. That's great. I mean, there was a review I saw uh, of of an American girl who I've actually asked my agents to inquire about supporting us in America next year. Um, Catherine Moan, she's brilliant. And if you haven't heard of her, check. No, out. Oh, we will. Yeah. Thank you, mate. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, will. Hundred percent. Because we're all about promoting new bands and new music. And actually, think of it, that's how I found you guys. Believe it's not. So, nineteen seventy nine. I went to Hammersmith Oden to see a certain Gary Newman because he, uh -huh. he was on top of the pops, though. And my dad went, yeah. he, my dad went he's cool, so I went and saw him. And then you guys came on and blew me away. So that's how I found uh -huh. you guys way back then. I've still yeah. got the program, actually. Oh, yeah. oh <laughs> yes. Well, you know, th th this is it. You know, I mean, Gary gave us a wonderful opportunity. But, I mean, so many people I meet say, first time I ever heard of you, you support you were supporting Gary Newman. And and so, you know, it, it was it was a great opportunity. And and exactly a year later, after Messages in Enola Gay had been released, we headlined and sold out the same tour that we'd done with Gary. So it gave yeah, us an yeah, opportunity yeah. To, to see how it's done, you know. Yeah. 
Yeah. I remember coming back to all my friends. I was like 15, 16, telling people like Mark about you guys then, you know. Could be you're right, because then there was yeah, top of the pops, the old grey whistle test. I know the tube, all those programs, you know, and they don't really exist anymore. There's Jules, which does yeah. this out here, and that's it, which is why me and Mark decided to do this and go, right, let's just try and help newer bands, but also talk to legends like yourself and me, and everyone else who have been so great, just in your time to come on and talk to us. But, you know, it's great. And, uh, yeah, this came out of lockdown, to be honest, as well. Same thing. I thought we need to do something if we can. And um, having people right. like you, just, you know, it's it's been an amazing journey. It's been absolutely mm-hmm. amazing. So, Andy, a quick question for you. Yeah. Oh, sorry, you're just going to say something. No, no, no. I was, I, was, uh, I, was, I was just going to blow smoke up your asses again, but I've done enough. Oh, you can do that. You can do that. <laughs> Frustration starts to grow. Bauhaus Staircase, you said you don't mention any names, but one of the things that jumped out to me was uh, Pierre Ubu and the Modern Dance. Oh, Pierre Ubu, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that was an album that came out probably, I guess, around the same time as you started, I I guess. And um, just out of curiosity, why the reference for Pierre, Pierre Ubu and the Modern Dance? I They were one of my favourite, favourite, Favorite live bands. I love the Modern Dance album. I mean, it's still, it's still now, you know, over almost forty-five years later, it's still a very strange fish that album. But I used to love going to see them at Eric's. I think I saw them at least twice, maybe three times at Eric's. They came, they came to play a lot, and um, yeah. And the reference actually came about completely by chance because I was just stream of conscious and um, yeah. So, so there's a. The, the, there's the lyric, you know, everybody needs art and passion. Everybody gets a second chance. And, I, and it was just like, out of the top of my head, I went, what rhymes with chance? Perubu and the modern dance? It just, just came <laughs> to me like that. So I wasn't intending to, to, to reference them, but literally I was looking for a, uh, looking for a rhyme with chance and I went, poof, Perubu and the modern dance just came straight oh. into my head because I, because I love the band and I love that album. And um the, the, the funny thing was somebody was asking about it recently and so i i went into youtube and i i was looking f- to see if they had a video for pair ubu and the modern dance and i typed in pair ubu the modern dance and up comes bauhaus staircase video first <laughs> so the, the youtube algorithms that i'm afraid yeah. peru have already been swamped by us but <laughs> and andy quick question which is it's a bit twofold really just we're I mean, trying to work out Obviously, this album came out of COVID, so it was done remotely. I think you was in Liverpool, Paul was in mm-hmm. France. Yeah. Um, back in the day, you had the gramophone suite studio, so like, the process, I guess, you was all in a room, bouncing ideas off of each other. Now, your roles are probably more defined, as in you work separately. I read somewhere that you send Paul ideas, and he tends to sort of like tweak and muck them about. I mean, what is what is what is your roles within OMD now? Okay. Um, I think because I sing on stage and I do most of the lead vocals, I think a lot of people have assumed that Paul writes the music and I do the vocals, but actually we've always done the music together and then I will will put the vocals on um, later. We started out in Paul's mum's back room, uh, which was a wonderful facility because she worked six days a week, (laughs) so she was always out. So we could make a lot of noise and, and not annoy her. Um, and you, yeah, you're right that that we we kind of feed off each other. It, it's great when you're in the same room and you can buzz. And, and I mean, there are melodies in songs that we don't know who really wrote the melody because Paul will be sat at the keyboard, but I will be going, yeah, I like that bit, but now go to da da da. Yeah, and then and then. Actually, that last phrase, move it up to, and so we're kind of. I'm directing him, and we're kind of writing it together. He's he's actually moving his fingers, but I'm the one that's kind of like picking and choosing. And so, and together we get to this place where, and this has always been for me. This has always been the wonderful thing that is yeah. working with Paul is, he's very generous. He lets me make the decisions. He 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 just generates things. He's a very gifted, talented musician and writer. But he lets me take his ideas and make them into whatever I want to make them to. There isn't an ego clash. Um, we often joke that, you know, 
two Pauls maybe wouldn't get anything done, but two Andys would kill each other. So <laughs> it's like, you know, we'd just fall out. So um, it was one of those things that uh, I was just really blessed to have to have met him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, when we were doing History of Modern, uh, we tried this sending things up and down the internet and we decided it didn't work. And English Electric and Punishment of Luxury, we were much more together. The problem is, though, that he was living in London then and I could just pop on the train, get down there and, and spend a few days living in his house and working in the studio. That was great. But now he lives in the south of France. Yeah. It's it's, it's a bit more difficult to just pop in the studio and have a, you know have have, have, a, have a little noodle for a couple of hours. So, um, with that plus COVID, this was this we were working remotely again, which we didn't you know we we didn't think we would want to do, but we had no option. To be honest as well, uh, without saying anything negative, Paul has always had um, Paul's always had more of a social life outside the band. Um, I tend to be very, very addicted to doing things with music. So once I get started, I just carry on. And I mean, yeah. you know, back in the gramophone studio days, you know, Paul was married. He would go home. I would carry on that. That's that's when I'd go off on my Joan of Arc binges and things like that. You know, I I was often in the studio late after Paul had gone home, um, and so that that hasn't really changed that much. I mean, or in this room that you can see now, all of the songs are pulled together in this room by me because I'm I'm a control freak basically. So I I want to have control of the, in my computer. I'm working on it. I'm changing it. If Paul comes here and we work on something together, great. Or I take it to France, but yeah. we didn't have that opportunity. So this time most of the arrangements, most of the the finalizing was done by me putting it into a kind of uh final arrangements and decision making. Paul is a much better mixer than me, though, and that's another balancing act that we have where we contribute together. Paul is much more objective, and also he's much better t technically than, than I am. My attitude to mixing is, you know, is everything louder than everything else? Just keep pushing the faders up. Um, Paul it, Paul has got a better overview than, than me, so um, it was mixed in his studio in, in France, but but it's um, it took him a long time because he kept moving house and rebuilding his studio. Yeah. So he's now he's now finally settled and has a great studio, but uh, we had to beg him, kick him, and cajole him to finally deliver the mixes in time to get this out this year. part of my question before we move on is that now obviously people work on logic or, or pro tools or whatever and you've got quantizing computers you've got you know all the software do you find that easier or harder than back in the day obviously you didn't have that technology back in the day so you had to find sounds and manipulate it and you know record it manually without all of these aids whereas now you've got the technology but you've got infinite choice of sounds tracks you, you know both both have got their problems i guess absolutely right it's a double-edged sword uh, i mean paul and i have a phrase which is the tyranny of choice <laughs> you know in the old days it was like right bass drum well either malcolm's going to play it or we're going to use the bass drum <laughs> off the cr78 that we can program you know snare drum we're either going to use this snare drum or the cr78 and 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 you know what, what you know chords well we've got an organ or we've got a mellotron and we've got you know, three cents and that's it, you know, yeah. the end. Now, yeah, I mean, when you when I start programming in this room now, it's like, right, bass drum, bass drum library, 2,854, <laughs> which one do I want to start with? <laughs> you know, it's, uh, so, yeah, you, you can end up with, with too much. And, of course, the computer allows you now to have, have almost an infinite number of stereo tracks. One of the great things about 16 or 24 track 
was you had to make decisions. You had to make editorial decisions. You couldn't just let it keep growing and getting fatter and fatter. And going, well, I like this hi-hat pattern, but I like that high pattern. I like these three different bass drum sounds. Maybe we'll combine them together. Maybe we won't. I don't know. And you just you leave you leave things till the end. Whereas back in the day, when you were on tape, yeah, it was like right, okay, oh, you've got a new idea, have you? Okay, is it better? than these other 24 ideas because we're going to have to erase something to put it on the tape you know so it was you really have to you know focus very clearly yeah. so so yeah the the machinery in some respects is wonderful because you can do things and and quantize it and play it and um and you know i'm useless on keyboard so i just bang it in roughly on a little mini keyboard and then fix it in the computer but yeah you can also have too much choice i mean paul although paul agrees with me about the tyranny of choice very often when paul sends me something i can see he's been noodling you know and and there's like there's eight different sequence of tracks and i'll just lock into a four bar loop and go right but that one no that one delete that one yeah maybe that one possible alternative that one delete that one delete right now i've got now I've got two choices. So, so I, 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 that's a, you know, yeah. I am the butcher when it comes to editing. That, that's why Paul and I work well together, though. We kind of we, we offset each other. The one thing I do like about the, the the computer now is when we used to work on tape. If you wanted to change anything, because that's why so many of our songs are very linear. They're the same chords all the way through. You know, a lot of people don't notice, but you know, the melody will come in, and then the verse will come in, and then we'll go to a middle eighth. They're all the same chord. It's just different things happen in them. Um, but if we really wanted to change something, we'd have to kind of like work on another piece of tape and splice it in. It was really yeah. slow. Whereas now you can cut and paste on the computer. It's it, it, yeah. it, it, it's like writing on Word. You just go right, copy repeat delete move that yeah. over there you know so yeah it, the pros and cons or <laughs> or the first chorus sounds great it's just copy copy don't have to sing it again you know <laughs> because you know the, the classic craftwork albums were recorded in the 70s on tape without quantize without sequences and they're just so perfect um if you listen to them properly you can hear the flowers oh yeah you, know? you, you, you can hear the drums and the bass slide occasionally but, but we, when you know, we were speaking humanity when we were speaking to wolfgang fleur we was like you know we was fascinated that you know he was in the room when these albums were being made and we sort of said you know what was it like and he just went ah oh, speak to cole bartos <laughs> <laughs> He didn't, he didn't want to. Go, he didn't want to go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, I think the thing is that that um, Carl said to me that the one thing he loved about being in Craftford for the first part of it was that they would all go into the studio every day and they would jam. They would play together, and these things would organically become the songs. Yeah. And he said that once they'd loaded everything into the computers, and once it became more computerized. He and Wolfgang weren't required, and, and they weren't they weren't going into the studio. Yeah. They weren't functioning as a band anymore, and he he found that really, um, you know, kind of soul destroying. Really, that that he was just sitting around do, doing nothing, yeah. and uh, and there was there was no there was no energy, there was no chemistry spark between the guys, and that that's. That is a problem with that is a problem with computers. You know, I mean, some some people think the computers write the songs, and people people have been talking to me in the last couple of weeks of interviews, going, "Well, you know, AI is coming. You know, well, how do you think that's going to influence?" I said, "Listen, I've heard songs that are, you know, AI Oasis and AI Beatles, and you know, they're they're a pastiche. You can see all the references they've referenced, but they are a pastiche. They they don't contain the human element. They don't contain the the wonderful things that." the you know the strange lateral turns that people would do that you wouldn't expect that and that's the beauty of it and and i think that um for me the sad thing about craftwork is i mean ralph hutter has now basically achieved what he was set out to, to which was his 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 you know his manifesto his mantra back in the 70s was you know we are going to just be like workers and the machines are going to write the music and the machines will play the music and he has effectively yeah. removed the human element from Kraftwerk. And I, I, the, the, he's not making much new music anymore, which, frankly, I think is a good thing because he's distilled out the human element to the point where the analogy I've made before is when you drink water, it has a taste because it's got impurities in it. 
if you distill water, you take out all the chemical impurities, it has no taste. Mm. And that's what Ralph has, has managed to do to yeah. craft work. He's actually taken out any human variation elements. And, you know, song, songs like, you know, Vitamin, it's got nothing in it. It's empty. It, it might as well have been made by AI. And I can't believe that, you know, 45 years after I fell in love with craft, 48 years after I fell in love with craft, I say this now. I mean, yeah. they're still the most important band in the history of popular music. I still love them, their their, their early music. Mm. But, you know, I always used to say that, you know, if, if Matisse had been able to use a laser printer, he would have. And his paintings wouldn't have had the charm and the human element. You know, yeah. he, he, he was yeah. trying to be perfect, but the fact that he couldn't be gave them the personal touch. And look, I know you've had a busy year touring as well as the album. You've been out, I've seen you at festivals with Heaven 17, Soft, Soft Cell. Are you going to be touring the album? Oh, yes. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we have a tour coming up in the new year. We will be going to Europe first, and then we will be coming to the UK and then the States in the autumn. Um I'm really looking forward to it because, of course, it's going to be the first time in six years that we've got some new songs to play. Mm -hmm. And January, January is going to be quite interesting because we're going to have that tussle of, okay, we worked it out in the computer and recording process. Now, how the hell are we going to play this, just the four of us? right? Will you ah. play that? You, Stuart, can you sample that drum as well as play your own? Yeah, and, and it, you know, it's we have to work out how to do it. I would imagine we'll probably play about, five songs maybe five and, and and use evolution as an an, an intro um I just don't think we can ask people to listen to an entire new album uh, in one sitting. Not that, that I don't think the songs are good enough. I just think that, you know, people, when you go and see a band, you want them to also play the hits that you love. Yeah, so true, yeah. there will, yeah. there will be, there will be the right balance, but I, I sound egotistical, but I do believe it's a great album. We wouldn't have released it if we didn't believe in it. Exactly. You know, we, yeah. we, 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 it's very cool being orchestral maneuvers in the dark. Now people say nice things about us. We we're talked about as being, you know, influential and iconic. Those are nice words to have associated. <laughs> the last thing we want to do now is to is to make a shit album and everybody go, oh god, I love the <laughs> <doing." laughs> right, If they play any of those tracks live, I'm going to the toilet. You know, <laughs> it's like... have you made, have you noticed? I mean, obviously you, you've been doing this for quite a long time. I've, and I've, I noticed a lot of the other bands I go and see, it's just not old people like me, but there's lots of younger people discovering your music now because of a lot of it's that things like, and I know it sounds really crass, Stranger Things influencing kids. You know, I've got two daughters in their early 20s going, they're falling in love with 80 synth music because of Stranger Things. So are you noticing a younger demographic becoming new fans, which I think you deserve, but are you noticing that? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I, absolutely. It's uh, it's really broadened out. It's not just all of the usual suspects in their, you know, fifties and early sixties. It's um, I think part of it is that we, you know, we live in this postmodern era where there is nothing brand new. Therefore, there's nothing completely out of date. I mean, you know, when we were younger, this was new, that was old, and then something else became new, and then that became old. And there was a linear progression. Whereas now. There's nothing brand new, so there's nothing there's nothing out of fashion. So, mm. <clears throat> excuse me, if if you um if you've still got the ability to do good music and and and, and people consider that you've got a great catalog in a genre and you can still play it well, then they will come and see you. And and and, but yeah, it's very different. I mean, you know, I mean, if I think back now, you know, when my parents were in their sixties, you know, would I have wanted to go and see? Frank Sinatra or Glenn Miller or you know what whatever they were Jeanette McDonald and Nelson Eddy no I don't think so uh, so so there has been there has been a complete sea change definitely which I'm delighted about
Definition of Luxury was going to be your last album, but I've read that you feel that this is going to be your last album. Is that the case? Paul, in particular, I think, is looking to have a different life now. You know, he's got a two-year-old and he wants to see her grow up. He doesn't want to Fair be enough. away all the time. And, and I think both of us feel that it's harder and harder to write songs as you get older because you keep going, oh, well, I've, I've written about that, I've written about that. Is there anything I'm really excited about? No, actually, I'd rather go for a walk in the sunshine. And I'll go and you know play with the kids or the grandkids. Or, although I, I don't have any grandkids, my kids are all grown up. But you know what I mean? It's like you you always think maybe it's time to just enjoy spe smelling the roses because who knows how long I've got now? You know, um, I didn't think I'd sit in this room and be able to mine myself for good ideas and good lyrics and melodies. It, increasingly, I think the hardest thing is to come up with lyrics and a vocal melody. I just, I just find that, I, I can still write interesting bits of music, but I just cannot mm. find the top lines or the lyrics anymore. So mm. this album, I'm amazed it came about. Paul kept saying to me, we're not going to release it if it's not as good as Punishment or Luxury. I said, we're not going to release it if it's not. No, I promise you, promise you, promise you. I'm not forcing the issue here. It's just Paul, I'm bored. I'm bored. I don't have any nappies to change, so I'm writing songs, and um, and I, I I think I think it's a very good album. Um, I think that people will be hopefully engaged that we are still doing something that sounds like OMD, but hopefully is also sounds new. Um, I think Bauhaus Staircase has already kind of made a claim to that. It's OMD, but not a pastiche of OMD. Yeah, and, um, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I'll never say never, but I'm not sure. It takes so long as well, doesn't it? A three, four, five year commitment for an album, like from the concept to writing, recording, mm -hmm. mixing, mastering, getting it out, touring it. It's a big chunk. And I guess, you know, me and Andy, I'm nearly 60, Andy's 60. I mean, you reach a certain time where you just think, yeah, like you say, it's a nice day. You want to go for a walk with the kids and, and do other things. You know, it's a big commitment. Exactly. It, it's, it's, um, it does take a long time to collect enough good material because, you know, you, you might get buzzing and you go, Oh yeah, this is great. This is great. And then you come back and I say and go, nah, I yeah. obviously had one, two yeah. glasses of wine last night. That wasn't as good as the thought it was. <laughs> um, you know, so, and as, as I said to you earlier, we will not release something unless we really think it's absolutely good enough mm. because the last thing we want to do is, yeah, kind of tarnish our reputation. Yeah, 100%. And if it is going to be the last album, the last song committed to an album would be Healing. Yes, which is would, beautiful. Would or did any extra sentiment or thought go into that, thinking that that would be the last track, or was it just that's the way it was sequenced and... The, that, no, that fitted as the last track. It was. It, it wasn't written as, as as a sort of an epitaph. I mean, if we wanted an epitaph, we could go back to final song. You know, <laughs> that's what we should have been. No, basically, um, we had twelve songs. Yeah, I knew. I knew that I wanted to kick off with Bauhaus Staircase because it was a statement, and I knew that Healing was a nice, gentle letdown. And we usually end with a slow song. Um, and as usual, we thought about the album, and we did this in Paul's studio. We thought about the album as an A side and a B side, and I did an old fashioned cut up. I wrote the I wrote the titles on pieces of paper, cut them up, and I went right Bauhaus staircase healing now, da, 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 da. and we did we did one draft, and we we listened through it, and he went okay. We need to move evolution onto the other side and bring GEM up because there's too many text of speak vocals. Um, and then the second run through, we just went, that's it. And it, it, no, it, it's, it's not intended to be an epitaph. It just it just landed up as the last song. I've got a couple of quick fire questions for you, mate, before we uh, wrap up. I'm really I'll try and give quick fire answers. I know I'm very verbose. No, no, you're not. You're it's been amazing. But I, I just, I guess, what's your, have you got a favourite OMD album? But apart from Bauhaus Staircase? Would you, I know they're all your babies. I, I, I was pleasantly surprised. Um, it always takes me several months to get used to a new album, not because I don't like the songs, because I'd have to get used to the mixes. 
I, I always listening to it going, God damn, I wish we'd done this. <laughs> um, recently, and I, I do, I do, you know, it's I probably sound like a narcissist, but I do listen to OMD song, albums sometimes. Um, I think Punishment of Luxury is up in the top three. Yeah. I thought it was that good. Yeah. Uh, and I think other people agreed with us as well. Um, we will see how Bauhaus Staircase fits. I'm not going to make any claims for it. Um, do you know what? It's not our best album, but I have a soft spot for the first album just because it's oh. so badly recorded and it does sound like two teenage kids making an album in a garage, you know, which basically it was. <laughs> I've, I've got to tell you, it's probably one of my top five 80s albums, I think. It really. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. Like I say, when I saw you live for the first time, that was it. I was a fan, as Mark is. So. So Desert Island Disc, you could take one album. Oh, yeah. So, and I'm interested because me and Mark always get it wrong. We're never even close. <laughs> so, have you got one? Um, it would be one of two. I finally got to meet Mikael Rota from Noi um, it, when I was over in Dusseldorf a few years ago when Rudy uh, uh, Rudy Esch invited me over to speak, and um, I went to see them play. And I went to dinner with him, and I was just like total fanboy. And, and I said to him, I said, somebody asked me, what's your most played album on your on your iTunes? And I thought it would be Kraftwerk or Roxy Music. Or something. It was your Flamenda Hertzen album. So it would probably be Flamenda Hertzen or Flesh and Blood by Roxy Music. A great shout. Take one of those two. Yeah, great shout. See, I would have gone straight for a Kraftwerk album, so I was completely wrong again. Yeah, I'd, 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 have, I'd have put my money on Kraftwerk album. Um, going back to favourite albums, mine is Architecture and Morality is as a why i'll tell you why because i was the synth player in the band with andy and the first time i heard that was he the good looking lead singer he was that's how it goes that's how it goes in synth duos yeah he um andy resembled david sylvian at the time but um <laughs> now I look like ross kemp <laughs> <laughs> but, um it was the opening simp sound of She's Leaving. Yes. Oh, uh, and I heard that sound and I just thought, Jesus, I just love that sound. still love that sound so i mean as well as souvenir joan of art made of orleans all the songs off of that album georgia all those songs yeah. i yeah. i love that album and i know it's probably Ro roland sh1 if you want to know i've got a... monophonic there you go yeah monophonic oh. just well i had the roland sh 101 and then i flogged that was my first ever sim but then i flogged it and then i flogged all my analog sims uh, Andy's shaking his head because he knows where I'm going. They'd be it. worth so much money as well now. Uh, he's he's, he's going to upset himself again, Andy, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, Juno 6, SH101. And when digital came out, I, you couldn't give them away. And I, I got rid of them. And then I've tried to rebuy a lot of the ones that I used to have. I had a Juno 6, but then they're so impractical, really. There's no, you couldn't store anything in it. I bought the Behringer copy of the SH101 mm -hmm. because the SH101s were so expensive. But interesting to know where that sound came from i mean that was the that was the noise that made me fall in love with that album it was wow amazing. well i i get you i mean the, the the crazy thing is now that you know a lot of younger artists are purists yeah. and they insist on using the analog synths and playing them by hand or midiing them all up and it looks like a bloody octopus's nest but you know to me having been through all of that i love the old analog sounds but do i want to wire them all up and twiddle all the knobs up. give me a soft synth every day because as far as i'm concerned the soft synths sound as good as these right. days um but yeah i mean you've probably heard the story that when the band reformed you know the thing about synths is 
some of the songs that we had are very sound specific and you actually have to get that synth to make that sound again and so we needed a Korg micro preset because ours wasn't working anymore more. and we'd forgotten to tell each other that we were both going to bid on the same one on ebay <laughs> 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 we drove the price up on each other <laughs> what can i say oh, I'm sorry pair of idiots um you was going to mention about your leeds art story yeah um it was only recently that i found out that had i gone to leeds poly to do fine art in 1978 I would have been on the course with, well, recently discovered actually a guy called Stephen Doan, who's the head curator of the LFC Museum at Anfield, which I didn't know, but more more famously, Green Gartside from Scritti Politi. Wow. And a certain Dave Ball and Mark Armand <laughs> were there on the same course. <laughs> that would have been either a super group or a super ego clash. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like uh, it's like the classroom in Basildon of Depeche Mode. I think, uh, yeah, Alison yeah. Moyet and Vince and all yeah. Martin, all those in the same class. Wow, that'd, yeah. have, been, so, that'd have been that'd have been a good um, that'd have been a good year at art school. Gotcha. Yeah, well, I, I and I told Mark Arman that this summer actually, and he he, he laughed his socks off. But <laughs> uh, it was uh, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm the one that didn't go because the band started, and I for years I thought, well, when the band finishes, I'll go back. And here we are, 45 years later. Thanks for your time. My final question is a total fanboy question, or our fanboy. Our okay. Question. Sorry, I keep having to adjust my glasses. I've got one ear higher than the other, and I keep noticing that they're crooked on. Them. <laughs> I, I, have the, I have the same problem. Um, you played on the famous 101 show in Pasadena with Depeche Mode mm -hmm. with Thomas Dolby and yourself. Um, what, oh, what was it like? What was it like to play with that show? Yeah, and why? What was it like to play that show? One phrase comes to mind: I was shitting myself. <laughs> <laughs> in fact my escape mechanism when i got very nervous was uh, my, my body would, couldn't take it anymore and i'd fall asleep and in fact i was asleep backstage right up to about 12 minutes before we went on stage which was my wow. coping mechanism wow. um and uh, my my nerves weren't helped by the fact that we walked on stage started in Ola gay and there was a power there was a power spike that oh. took out took out the disc loading uh, emulators and so the first 40 seconds of Enola gay were drum bass and vocal because the two keyboards were reloading so oh. one of the longest 40 seconds of my life it was an amazing gig and recently recently Depeche have actually released the footage of us playing I've oh, finally wow. seen it I knew we were filmed but it was never used in their film right um but Depeche actually released some footage of us on stage and it is it is quite amazing is that uh, the remaster box set thing they released um Last year. I don't, I don't, I don't honestly know where it came from. I just somebody alerted me to it on on YouTube, and uh, and and or Vimeo, and that there it was, and it was, um, yeah. I think you could see us walking out onto the stage, and you could see me bouncing around in front of you know all the, this full stadium. Mm. I mean, it was an amazing tour, and it was an amazing way to end. But yeah, I was absolutely bricking myself. But that was you know typical. That was that was the tour that basically broke us because. We'd been trying for five years to break America, and that tour really opened up America to us. But yeah. we were we were earning five thousand dollars a night and losing hemorrhaging money, and Depest were earning enough to retire on. And you know the two bands had just gone like that, basically. Or, you know, whichever one had gone up, one had yeah. gone down, and and it was just. Um, that was kind of the beginning of the end for us, actually, because after that we got home and our and our manager said. You owe Virgin Records a million pounds in mm -hmm. unrecouped royalties, and we're like, "How is that so? We've sold all these millions of records." Like, well, yeah, yeah. you know, you you've. I mean, and we didn't have castles and yachts and jets. You know, we were fairly frugal. It's just that they were giving it with one hand and taking it back with five hands. You know, the yeah. royalty rate was barely legal, and um, 
And every, you know, every video, every tour support, every recording cost, every video cost was all charged back. And um, so the best of came out. We 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 balanced the books, and then I think after that, it just put, we were all so exhausted and depressed that that's mm-hmm. that's why the band split up. So, uh, yeah. but yeah, it was it was an amazing amazing tour, um, and I, I'll, I'll never forget that. And I'm glad that there was footage of it, the Rose Bowl. I mean, yeah, I meet people in America now who talk about that tour as as being seminal to them. A bit like you know, sort of the the, the Newman gig in seventy nine. Thanks, Andy. I mean, having the opportunity to speak to you, I mean, I mean, as well as your own amazing legacy to play that iconic show as well is is, is an amazing thing to have on your CV as well. So I mean, it, mm. I can only imagine. I've never seen the OMD footage. I'll I'll seek it out, mm. but I can imagine it was a. Phenomenal tour, phenomenal experience. It was, it was, and and you know that the the strange, sad epitaph to that is that um, we we when we played in the, the Greek theatre in LA um, recently, it was the day that it was announced that Andy Fletch had passed away, yeah. and so. I was thinking, what the hell am I going? I've got, to, I've got, you know, I've got to say something. You know, all these people. I mean, I, I could see, you know, loads of people have brought out their Depeche shirts as a sort of as a reverence to him. I had to say something, and and I, I spent all day kind of thinking, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? Because I've got to say something. So, so I said to our, I said to our lighting crew, I said, here, I'm going to send you some pictures. Will you put these up on the iMag screens of, of Fletch? And after we've done the second song, I'm going to talk about it and because otherwise people will spend the whole gig going is he going to say something well, you know and i just said listen you know we're so sad uh all of you guys are probably depeche fans as well as omd fans and, and we can't believe it um there's nothing we can do to bring him back the only thing we can do is do what bands do and celebrate the music legacy and so and i just said so will you dance with us tonight like you did at the rose bowl in 1988 oh wow that, and and that seemed to be the right thing to say. Hundred yeah. percent. Well, Mate, I, I just want to say, you know, we've seen you live many times over the years. As I say, you were the first support band I ever saw, and and you know, you still blow us, blew us away then. You blow us away today, and some of your stuff. Glad you're playing live. I just want to say, you know, thank you for being such a big part of the that music tapestry that inspires me and Mark. It really done. We're just honoured that you've come on the EC. Um, I hope we can do this again sometime in the future. But it's been definitely, absolutely- definitely. Well, you know, we, we 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 can do it again after the album's out, and you can tell me how crap it is. So, <laughs> yeah, so I'd love to do this again when we've got something new to talk about, or you you know you, you've absorbed the album, and um, and listen, you know, if it is the last OMD album, well, then you guys need to get back together and make the next one. <laughs> <laughs> will you produce it for us? <laughs> we'll, and we'll, we'll support Just don't you. ask Paul to mix it because it'll take fucking years. <laughs> <laughs> we might even support you on the tour. You never know. Hey, Mate, there you um, go. No, that solves God. all of our problems. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Okay, guys, great fun. Thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you, mate. Cheers, Absolutely. Man. It's a great joy and honor. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Right, bye now. Cheers, buddy. Take care. So that's it for another episode of the Electronic Cafe. I really hope you enjoyed our conversation with Andy McCluskey as much as Mark and I did. Andy, thank you for coming on the show, sir. It was an absolute honour, privilege, and more importantly, just great damn fun. Um, you know, just amazing to talk to you and uh, wish you every bit of success for Bat House Staircase um, and looking forward to seeing you live sometime next year. Talking of live events... If you haven't got your tickets for Electronic Cafe Live Volume 2 yet, you really should. Uh, what an evening we've got lined up for you at Club 229, Great Portland Street in London. Uh, we are having uh, along Peter Dugal, Tiny Magnetic Pets, Wolfgang Fleur. All that wasn't enough. We have a DJ set by the fabulous Mark Reader. So get your tickets. I'll ask Mark to put a link down here. Um, we'll look forward to seeing you before then, obviously, on the Electronic Cafe. But we also look forward to welcoming you to that event. Say, so, March the 16th, Club 229. Get your tickets and uh, we'll see you soon on the Electronic Cafe. Take care. Bye-bye for now.